Hi, Mr. Gross. What's going how are on? You? Good. How are you, Delena? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. You bet. Pleasure. So uh, let's just jump right into uh, talking about Arnold Jacobs. Um, so I know that's something you are very passionate about and, and do a lot of uh, spend a lot of your work doing. So let's talk about who Arnold Jacobs was and then kind of what his legacy was within Chicago Symphony and then um, just uh, among brass players in general. So let's see, Arnold Jacobs, 1915 to 1998. He was the principal tubist of the Chicago Symphony from 1944 to 1988. Uh, prior to that, he held positions uh, for five years in the Pittsburgh Symphony under Fritz Reiner. And prior to that, he was tubist with the Indianapolis Symphony. And prior to that, he was at the Curtis Institute for about seven years. And prior to that, he lived in Long Beach, California, where he mostly grew up. He was born in Philadelphia, but his family moved westward shortly after he was born. So he's mostly was raised in Southern California and, uh, and then, then went east for school, Curtis and then on into the profession. Um, as far as uh, his legacy with the CSO, was largely regarded as the uh, you know, best orchestral tuba player of certainly the second half of the 20th century. Um, there's, you know, people came in the later half of the 20th century, other people came along like Warren Deck and, and uh, others who were, you know, really fantastic as well. Um, but that period of time uh, in the mid mid 20th century and on to the later part of the 20th century, he he was a pretty much a setting the standard as far as how, you know, tuba uh, goes. Um, and so he he uh, along with his his uh, colleague on principal trumpet, Adolf Blood Herseth, and then all the other great, really amazing um, brass players in the middle between those two bookends, you know, principal trumpet and, and tuba, um, they developed this, this notion of the Chicago brass sound during the 1950s. And that, uh, that's been a tradition there ever since. And, and others, other orchestras have certainly come along with their brass sections and created their own, their own traditions as well, so. Hmm. And so what is the whole idea of Arnold Jacobs' pedagogy? Um, what were the main principles of his teaching and um, why was he like so sought after in what he was teaching to people? So the, the main, the main uh, um, points of his pedagogy uh, was have a song in the head and make sure you have enough wind at the lips uh, to, to uh, make it happen. That was basically it. The sort of the dirty little secret of the, about the Jacobs method is that there is no Jacobs method. He taught mm. he taught people as individuals, and he he uh, constructed a curriculum uh, for each person that was in the studio with him at the time. And he didn't he didn't run them through uh, you know a systematic you know this week we'll do this, next week we'll do that, third week we'll do that, fourth week we'll do that. It was all very very much. Um, working on things that would come up in the lesson at the time. Uh, and over the course of time, when you study with him over a fair amount of time, then you would pretty much cover pretty much all the bases. Um, why he was sought after was because he had um, a very unique um, um, knowledge of human anatomy, structure and function, psychology, getting kind of windy out here. Does that bother you? That's all right. Okay. Um, he, um, he had an amazing uh, knowledge of how the bo human body works and how we're wired. Uh, and, and his, um, his knowledge of, of psychology, uh, along with that, uh, the, how the body functions was terrifically important. So motivations became a very big part of his teaching, learning how to motivate the student to achieve, to reach their maximum potential. So he was, a, he was an excellent motivator and he would, he would uh, spend a lot of time getting to know you uh, in a lesson, he would be conversing with you. If you were a new student, he would spend a fair amount of time. This, he, would, he would often say that the first lesson was really for him to get to know you better and to understand 
what you were interested in, what turned you on, what excited you, what would motivate you. And then he would work to, um, in lessons, he would work to go down those paths that really were interesting for you and motivated you rather than him telling you from on high, this is what you need to do if you're going to be successful. He would, he would find you where you lived, extend his hand, and take you on this journey uh, of learning the music. And as you learn the music, you'd learn your instrument as well. Hmm. And so, you know, I've heard a lot about Alexander Technique. I know that that's a really big, um, I guess, technique that people use. And, you know, when I was studying trumpet, that was like one of the first trumpet teachers I've ever had. He was really big on Alexander Technique, had the belt, you know, on and everything. So maybe how much did that factor into the way that he taught? Because I know that he, you know, used a lot of like instruments to measure breathing and things like that. Um, so how similar, if at all, are those two techniques? You know, it, I, I only know as much of Alexander Technique as I learned from John Hennis when I was when I took his course at Northwestern when I was in college back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a he's a highly regarded Alexander Te Techniques teacher. Um, uh, I would inc uh, uh, I remember talking to Mr. Jacobson in a lesson or two about this, and um, I think to the ex I don't know. This is all to say I, I'm not an expert in Alexander Technique, so I would not want to really comment on on Alexander Technique. But um, from what I remember from my class with John Hennis, classes with John Hennis, and then Mr. Jacobs. So there's some overlap. There's some over overlap between what Jacobs would teach and what Alexander Technique would teach in terms of um, just finding that body relaxation and, you know, finding the most efficient, efficient way to be seated and uh, while playing. And for Jacobs, that was generally, you know, being sitting tall, sitting as if you were standing. And uh, that helps the, respir the respiratory system to, to really function well, you know, efficiently. Uh, was if you're slumping over, you know, if you're slouching, these types of things, then that that really is prejudicial against the respiratory system achieving maximal results with minimal effort. And so um, uh, that's what I that's what I remember uh, about that. But for Jacobs, it was really just finding finding the the least amount of effort to get the maximum results. So finding that sweet spot where you weren't working too hard, you weren't working too, too little, just sort of the, in the, in the middle, uh, in the middle of, of, um, your, your effort to find that, to find that maximum results. Hmm. Um, and so when you find that maximum results with minimal efforts, then you're very relaxed and you'll, you've, you have a great resonant sound and you, it, it's, it, it feels easy. And that's, that's that's what you want. You don't want to be struggling all the time, working hard all the time, especially right. as you get older. Because as, when you're younger, you know, the, the the muscles regenerate. You know, the muscle tissue recoups its its losses overnight pretty well when you're younger. But as you get older, it takes a little bit longer. And um, you know, I remember uh, Dirk Nowitzki with the Dallas Mavericks. You know, towards his last couple of seasons. They had to work out a, a schedule where he would sit out every game, every other game or something like that, or he'd be play every third game or something like that because he just couldn't, his, his, his body at his age, which was early 40s, just couldn't recover enough uh, to play the game the next day or uh, two days later. So similarly with, with you know, our, our, own, our own muscle fibers and tissues, we, we need to, as you get older, you need to be smarter because – you can't just bash yourself, bash your face against the wall day in and day out and expect to be successful. There's going to be problems as you get older. So he would teach us in the younger, in, a, in our, those of us who were younger studying with him, he would teach us to develop these, these really efficient approaches so that as we, as we um, got older, we would grow older within the profession gracefully and enjoy success uh, through our 50s and 60s and even on into the 70s. I think he was during his seventies when he retired. Uh, yeah, early seventies, mm -hmm. late sixties, early seventies. Excellent. And so, is this something that is really just mostly useful for brass players, or what can what can all types of wind players and even maybe string players just take away from this? 
um, in their own practice. I think you want to find the simple, the, find the simplicity. That's the, I think that's the key is to find the simplicity. I really try to avoid, you know, in terms of the simplicity in terms of how you, how you interact with your instrument, how you couple yourself to your instrument, how you, you know, operate your instrument. Uh, you want to, you want to, want to keep your thoughts really on simple, simple things. And f um, for Jacobs, you know, he was encountering many people who were trying to control specific muscle groups through direct thought of controlling that muscle group. And, and he knew that the way we're wired as people is, is, is it's in order to control the, the body, you want to think of simple thoughts. You want to think of simple commands. And oftentimes he would, he would uh, say, uh, here's, a, here's a pencil, catch the pencil. And he would throw the pencil to somebody and they would catch the pencil. And he'd say, now, can you describe in, very, in detail, you know, which muscle groups, what you did to control the muscle groups? And of course, no, they weren't thinking about the muscle groups. They were thinking about catching the pencil. As you control, um, as, you can, as, you, as you go for the product, you control the body. And so as you were trying to catch the pencil, you were controlling what the body needed to do in order to be successful. It's something that, that um, an analogy that I'll use with students is, you know, did you ever, do you remember the first time you climbed a tree? Yeah, I remember, I remember. Okay, um, when you, when you, before you first climbed that tree, did you go to the library and check out a book on how to climb the tree? And no, I didn't do that. I said, well, what did you do? Well, I, I guess I just saw some friends climbing a tree and I just, I wanted to do it too, so I did it. And so, you know, they just would imitate. They would, they would copy others, and that's a really great way to, a really great place to put your mind as you're trying to control your body is just through imitation or achieving of a certain goal or product. You know, product in, in this terminology meaning goal um, um, or outcome, you know, not, not necessarily a product that you, like a can of green corn that you buy off of the, the grocery shelf, but, but um, an achievement, an outcome, is what what we're talking about here and so you want to keep your mind simple and so your mind your thoughts simple on in terms of how you interact with your body but you want to use your intellect for your artistry so you know he would very much always be about um, developing your thinking towards art uh, using great intellect you know thinking about colors thinking about phrases, thinking about articulations, you know, the various articulations that are available. Um, it's not just one or two articulations. There's dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of potential articulations. And, you know, these all have to do with the mood of the music, the style of the music, making sure that you're, that you're, that you're engaged in the style of the music and, and uh, uh, that you have a, a really great concept of the style of the music and that you're trying to bring that style to the music that you're playing. That's where the intellect that's where the the the, uh, the thinking uh, should be, is, is you know, in terms of what he was what he was saying. Leave the leave the complexity of thought alone when you're inter interacting with the body. Go for the simple simple commands. Go for the um, if you want to breathe, breathe. When you blow, blow. But don't think about various muscle groups that have to that have to engage. Um, because it's not it's not this muscle or that muscle this deltoid that deltoid it's it's there's a there's all all manner of things that have to happen in your body in order to to achieve any particular activity standing up even just holding my arm up like this there's a whole bunch of other things that are happening in the body to keep me balanced and there are other muscle groups in the body that are that innervating to uh, to uh, make just make this happen um, we can't comprehend them. On a conscious level, um, but if we want to, if we want to raise our hand, we just raise our hand. We don't think about the the various muscle muscle functions that are that have to happen in order for that to take place. So it was a matter of for him. It was uh, keep it simple with your thoughts in terms of how you you in, in, engage with with your instrument, you know, your body and your instrument, and then keep it very um, artistically complex and interesting with your music your music making. Um, and, you know, lo most people who would go to him initially, or maybe just had one or two or a few lessons with him, 
would, you know, they'd be going there because they were having trouble. You know, they were having issues. They were having physical and sometimes emotional issues. And um, he would he would work on that and uh, he would help them generally um, to untangle themselves, you know, from the knots that they had uh, over some period of time put themselves into uh, through the complexity of thought when um, affiliated or associated with operating the instrument. So, you know, with the body, you know, trying to control the body so much that uh, it just became a, what he would call paralysis, paralysis by analysis. Hmm. And, um, you know, basically this stems from his knowledge of the human truth that there are two, basically um, uh, there's, there's a um, uh, set of nerves, you know, ner nerves that are motor nerves. Those are motor nerve activity is where I'm importing information to the environment around me. And you, Delano, in Boston are uh, receiving that information um, uh, through receptor nerves. And so you're evaluating information that you're receiving from me. I'm, I'm imparting information. You're, you're evaluating information. The last thing you wanted to be doing while you're playing your instrument is to be evaluating the information that you're supposed to be imparting. Mm -hmm. It's very confusing up here when you do that. And it, it generally um, uh, ends up in a uh, less than convincing product or musical statement when you do that. So you want to be, you want to be um, uh, very much uh, what, what I would call a motor nerve musician. Uh, uh, you know, then there are times when you when you are, you want to know, well, what am I doing? How can I make it better? When you're asking questions, you're evaluating. And that's where the tape recorder, you know, taking out your phone or whatever device you have to record yourself, record yourself and then evaluate heavily on the playback. That's where you evaluate. And that's where you figure out, I like this or I don't like that these types of things. But while you're playing, you generally want to stick with the message that you're trying to share with your audience. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have some amount of low level feedback. You're going to, there's always going to be some amount of, of lower level um, uh, evaluation, you know, how things are going while you're playing. But the trouble is, a lot of times it's way, it's just so high, that evaluation is really dominant. And uh, it's not on a low level. It's on a very high level. It takes up a lot of space in the brain uh, at, at that point. And you want to make that you want to make that um, that that a feedback, that evaluative um, activity to be lower. Like on the order of percentages, Jake said uh, Jacobs would say 15% um, awareness of the body, 85% awareness of the music. Uh, you know, as you were as you were doing that. So 15%. Um, receptor nerve activity, 85% motor nerve activity hmm. while playing. And so when you're talking about these kind of like evaluative thoughts that you might have, what are mm -hmm. some examples of something that either in a practice or a performance a musician might come across and know, okay, that's something that I shouldn't be thinking about at this moment in time? I think pretty much anything that takes away from the, from the music itself, what you're trying to say through the music, uh, gets in the way and the question then is well is it getting in the way enough so that it's it's interrupting with my musical statement or is it it's not really in the way I'm aware of this I'm aware of you know that articulation wasn't really what I wanted uh, you know or, or I didn't perceive it and here's the other thing is a lot of times we'll perceive we are really we are not in a position uh, behind the instrument to evaluate what they out there are hearing. You know, oftentimes we just are not in the position. And so I'm sure you've had this experience where you will record yourself playing and you'll listen back and the stuff that you thought was kind of bad, well, it wasn't that bad at all, actually. It turned out pretty good. So, um, and you know, the reverse can be true where you thought things were going great and you listen back on the playback and it's like, oh my gosh, that's, what, that sucks. <laughs> How, how could I think that was okay? So we, we're just really not in a great position behind the instrument to evaluate it well and efficiently and accurately what is getting out into the, into the room, into the hall, to the audience. And so that's where the tape recorder, you know, the recording devices can really be helpful. And you learn a lot, you know, you learn a ton from listening to yourself on the playback. And um, that's, that's really important. So in terms of, you know, these kinds of thoughts, you know, oh, I didn't like that articulation or that seemed out of tune. 
Uh, am I gonna make, am I gonna get this note or am I gonna miss this note? You know, these types of things are distracting to the, in the mind, to the, to the real, the real um, topic at hand, which is, you know, style and communication. Hmm. And so talking about this whole matter of like managing the efficiency of your breath and uh, not really trying to control all these muscles and things like that. I know when non-musicians, um, you know, watch wind players especially play, they're just so amazed by, they say, oh wow, you can hold your breath for so long. But really that's not what we're doing and, and it's just a matter of like managing your breath. So what advice, if any, do you have for non-musicians um, to help manage their breath um, in just kind of their general lives? Uh, in regard to walking down the street or sure, sitting yeah, at a desk just, or? Mm -hmm, yeah, so people are, you know, maybe having a little bit more of an active lifestyle and find that maybe they have difficulty breathing. Obviously, there's, you know, different medical things that could be going on and stuff like that, but maybe something simple that people might be able to take away that musicians practice that maybe somebody might not ordinarily think about. Well, you know, so I'm going to turn that on its head because um, so often my teaching centers around getting my students to actually just breathe and manage their breath just like a, a, a regular person would. Because along the way, during our, our early years with our wind instruments, uh, wind and brass instruments, and as we, as we get older, we seem to develop this notion, I know I certainly did before I studied with Jacobs, that there is this, there is this uh, sort of super top secret um, secret sauce way of approaching the very best, most efficient musical breath, you know? And really it's uh, what you wanna do is just breathe like a people, just be, take people breaths and, and blow, blow like a person would or blow air like you would if you need to blow out a candle or a match or these types of things. Um, you want to relate more to the, the people than the people want to relate to you in terms of just the, you know, the non-musician versus musician. Um, uh, you, you don't want to make it, you don't want to make it overly complex. You want to keep it, really keep it simple in terms of how you manage your, manage your air um, and, and, and breathing. So um, just in terms of the, just a regular person, um, I, I don't have any advice for an, a regular person other than just keep breathing. That's really important. And then um, for a musician, I would, a wind musician, I would, I would, you know, I would encourage them to uh, observe how we breathe when we are not musicians, mm -hmm. but we are just people. You know, how do you breathe? How do you take it? Like, I'll, I'll get students who will come in and say, how do I take a full breath? And we'll work on that. And if, if um, they have some sort of um, habits that are in place from prior training or uh, um, prior training, I'll, I'll have them run up and down the steps. Maybe you've seen people run up and down the steps around my studio at U of O. Um, and they're just, I have them run up and down the steps three or four times, you know, going down to the food lounge and up to the, up to the top floor of the faculty tower and back. I'll have them do it three or four times. And then when they, when they get back, They're breathing great. I said, okay, that is the breath that you want to use when you need to take a breath to play a, something that's a long phrase or maybe it's heroic playing loud or something, or maybe it's particularly low and loud. That's the kind of air that you want to develop. You just don't want to have to run up and down three flights of stairs three or four times before you have to you know, come in on your entrance. But that's what that did. What that does is it shows the student that they can do it. You know what they what the there's there's this the breathing skills that they have in nature that that they're that they have just as human beings is all that they need and so they just need to access that way of doing it which is very simple because we all know how to deeply breathe after we've just run around the track or if i've been you know chasing you down the hardwood as you're beating me in for a layup you know i know how to breathe deeply after you after you do that um, but I'm not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking I got to breathe deeply. My body says you need to get in some air, but then I just use that technique. I transfer that technique of just full breathing to 
not being out of breath, but to developing that skill um, mm. while I'm while I'm playing the instrument. But I, of course, I developed that skill away from the instrument. You know, I developed these ideas of, of full breaths and uh, how to how to um, manage the the exhalations and that sort of thing. I'll, I'll develop that away from the instrument so as not to confuse the the physical act of breathing with really the most important thing, which is the artistic aspect of of, of communication with the with the mm. music. So I'll develop these breathing skills out away from the instrument and then I'll just apply them to when I play the music. That way my mind is is when it's time to play, I'm focusing on the music and the, the artistic intent and the style. I'm not thinking about this physical thing of breathing. That that's in the background, it's a habit. It's a, it's something that's been learned, and then we just apply it. Hmm. Excellent. And so, what can maybe we can just talk a little bit about your personal experience with Arnold Jacobs and um, your study? And I know that you studied with him for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, really, what drew you maybe to study with him initially, and then, um, you know, obviously you stayed around with him for so long. So maybe there's some stories you might tell. Yeah, well, um, I, I um, was uh, in, I went to, my first two years of, were at Clark Community College up in Vancouver, Washington. I'd graduated from Jefferson High School in Portland, Oregon. And um, it was the arts magnet at that time. It was part of desegregation um, back in the 70s. And so they were, um, Jefferson High School was and, and, and is a, a predominantly African-American population, student population. And uh, it was actually in my, more or less in my neighborhood um, anyway. Um, so I was going there, but there was, uh, there would be, be um, student, music students from all over the, all over the city that would come and, and take music classes there because it was the arts magnet. And so it was like a fame high school. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that movie or the, there was a TV show mm -hmm. called Fame and yeah, about uh, the, arts, the arts high school in, in New York City. It was similar to that. We had dance. We had music like the Jefferson dancers are still they're still a thing. They're still around. Hmm. Um, uh, there's music. There was uh, drama. And then there was a uh, uh, television, television arts. Hmm. It had the the um, they had converted um, uh, the the old one of the old gyms at, at Jefferson High School into a, a, a television studio. So it was a it, there was a lot going on um, there. And so I was I, I decided that. I wanted to go into study music into college, and I went to uh, Clark College in Vancouver. And uh, I was corresponding with one of my high school classmates who had actually gone to Northwestern, and uh, we were like writing letters back and forth. And he said, "You ought to come to Northwestern. There's a it's a really great music school, et cetera, et cetera." And I'd always known that I would need to leave Portland um, in order to more or less make it big in Portland. Um, because, you know, um, uh, if once you go away somewhere and you come back, then people look at you differently. Mm. They think you, you've gone somewhere that's kind of big. And when you come back, you must have the secret sauce recipe. You know, you, you, you've got this extra bit of information that, that they want and they, that they, they look at you differently. That's something my band director in high school had, uh, had, uh, said, uh, Jim Little. Mm. And, um, so you know, I had it in my mind that I needed to leave Portland. And um, uh, so going to Northwestern, okay, my friend Dan is there. So we'll, I'll, I'll try that. And, and when I went up to uh, Stadium High School in Tacoma to play my, um, my admission audition for the tape recorder um, back in, in uh, 1981, the admissions director, their version of Bob Ponto um, was uh, were there Jim Moore was there and he said that's that's very good now I just want to let you know that our, our tuba professor is Bob Rusk and I said yeah that's what I read in your your catalog Bob Rusk tuba player with the Milwaukee Symphony uh, but I just want to clarify Mr. Moore said I just want to clarify that Arnold Jacobs does not teach at Northwestern and I said mm -hmm. who's Arnold Jacobs and uh, he said that's all I needed to hear thank you so uh, I was admitted and that that very fall, they brought Mr. Jacobs back. And so we got lessons with Jacobs and with Bob Rusk for that first year. And Bob was a protege of Mr. Jacobs. So, you know, it was, you know I was hearing, hearing the similar things from them both. 
Um, and then the following year, um, they just brought back Jacobs full time. Again, he had taught there for 25, 26, I don't know, a lot of years. Um, and then he had a disagreement with, with um, Fred Hemke, who was the sax professor there and the winds percussion uh, department chairman uh, mm -hmm. about something and they parted company, but then, then they brought him back. So I got, to, I got to Chicago really not knowing anything about Mr. Jacobs. Other people would tell me about Jacobs. I had no idea. And then I had my first, my first lesson with him and it was bam, mm -hmm. life changed. Absolutely the course of my life changed. And it was this notion of simplicity because I came to him as a very, very, uh, uh, with a very complex approach to the instrument and, and trying to manipulate my body and think of trying to manipulate muscles and where my tongue was exactly, trying to imagine like I would be, I would receive instruction in my prior studies in, in Oregon, like, okay, you want your tongue to be three millimeters um, um, behind your teeth and this kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was like, so you're trying to do that. And so you're putting your mind on the focus of, of this, these very precise inward manipulations. And it just was, yeah, it was like, it was like a juggler, you know, and I would routinely drop the balls. So mm -hmm. I got to my first lesson with Jacobs and it was, it was simple. It was absolutely simple. And I had one of these out-of-body experiences, you know, because he got me to do something in the first five or ten minutes of my lesson that was, I had this amazing sound come out of the bell. Like, who did that come from? It came from me, and I felt more relaxed. So I got a better product for less effort. And I just got this out-of-body experience where I had this, like, little, you know, cartoon, you know, you had this little cartoon bubble that I was talking to myself, you know, with and I was like, wow, that's so easy. That's so simple. It really is simple. Oh, my gosh. And I got this smile on my face as I was having this conversation with myself. In the meantime, Jacobs is talking to me further. But, I, of course, I had zoned him out. You know, like, you know, I was just talking to myself. <laughs> and he's talking. And then he said, and he saw this smile come on my face. And he says, you think it's funny, but it's not. And I, I snapped <laughs> back into reality. You know, I said, oh, no, no. I didn't know. I'm not laughing at you, Mr. Jacobs. Anyway, so that was in 1981, and I had my last lesson on August 15th, my parents' uh, um, 38th wedding anniversary, 1998, and that was the last time I saw him. He died eight weeks later, and that was a it was a uh, that was a sad day. That was a sad day. David Federley uh, called and gave me the gave me the uh, the news, the sad news. Um, but but. Uh, so from 81 to 98, you know, obviously when I was in school, I had weekly lessons and then I would come back. Uh, I was the principal tubist of the Savannah Symphony from 86 until I left in 2001 to start at U of O. And uh, I would come back periodically uh, to get to get lessons with him. You know, if it was if it was a Beethoven week or something, then I would I would arrange to come up and have a have a lesson with him. Uh, so I continued studies and, and oftentimes I would also just call him up just for some advice. You know, and those were always very helpful, you know, because he he knew what was going on and he could he could diagnose over the phone like nobody's business. And so uh, the advice that he would offer was, you know, spot on. And I would actually I would actually um, call him up and, and uh, ask him for advice on some difficult uh, problems I was having with a student in terms of how to help that student. You know, I just wasn't sure how to what advice to give for a particular issue a particular student was having and he was very helpful for that too yeah mm -hmm. so i stayed in touch with him um a fair amount and uh it was um it was a great a really really great experience and you know when i um i thought i knew him pretty well in 1990 by, by the time he had passed in 1998 and then i started doing this tuba people tv project and you know this this figure that i thought i knew really well was you know, he became like four dimensional after mm. speaking with 140 people and their, their, their lesson experiences with him. So. But he pretty much changed the direction of wind musician pedagogy in terms of how the, how the air, your respiration goes. And, you know, he, when he was at Curtis, he studied uh, musicianship with Marcel Tabito and that was, 
Yeah, that was one of his favorite classes. And he took it repeatedly. He took it more than once. You know, he took it um, as often as, as Tabby Toe would let him in the class. Um, but that's, so then we got, uh, you know, that's where he got the, uh, the note grouping um, um, idea. He brought note grouping to like the brass area, brass realm, uh, in terms of microphrasing these types of things that uh, mm -hmm. Tabby Toe taught. And is more common in, in, your, in your woodwind tradition than it is in, in the brass tradition. Um, so he, he, he really changed, uh, changed the way wind musicians, brass players in particular, but winds in general um, view respiration. You know, it used to be pre-Jacobs, it was very much a, the tight gut, you know, firm up your abs and that sort of thing. And um, through his studies of, of anatomy, he realized, well, that's, that's working against having a, a good amount of air. And uh, when you get below a certain level in your, in your air capacity, when you get below half, that's when the, the pressures inside the mouth increase because the, the air flow decreases. And so when the air flow decreases, the pressure increases. That's where you have a lot of discomfort. And like, you know, um, I don't know how, what it is on a, on a bassoon, but like with the, maybe you remember playing trumpet, you know, there'd be just some, you'd just be working kind of hard and you'd sense this, this strain. And, you know, it was often just related to that decreasing uh, air flow because the pressure is increasing. Um, and, and some of that was, is of course, related to tessitura, you know, you know higher, higher notes. Um, but then, then uh, um, oftentimes it, it can be helped. Even the higher notes can be helped with just thinking just slightly, a little bit more flowy. And that, mm -hmm. that brings that sensation of, of effort down and you feel a little more comfortable. So he changed that. He changed, he got us away from the tight gut and, um, and got us more into um, fuller air use fuller air use the mm -hmm. positive in the positive parts of the respiration system excellent and so um you know obviously you talked a little bit about um the way you teach your students and you know you've been in contact with arnold jacobs about um certain issues and how to approach your students um, but what are some other ways that you continue to kind of share this message? You talked about Tuba People TV, um, and then, you know, just the various other ways that you continue to kind of keep this um, train of thought going, I suppose. Yeah. Well, um, I'll do regular posts, uh, posts on Facebook about some of his, his isms, so his quotes, you know. Um, I will, I, in 2012, I started the Tube of People TV and where I travel around the world interviewing former students of Jacobs, you know, thousands and thousands of thousands of students around the world through his career, his, uh, uh, you know, 40, had, he had students in the 30s, obviously more students in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and in, into the late 90s, in 98s when he passed away. And he had a student from Germany at his studio waiting him for, for him to show up. Uh, the day he died. Mm. And um, so Brian Fredrickson had the, the sad duty of having to go into, into Chicago to give that student from Germany the bad news that he wouldn't be having a lesson. And uh, that Mr. Jacobs had passed away. Um, um, so in my project, the earliest lesson I have, less, I should say the earliest student I have is Bob Rada, the trombonist. There's two Bob Reda's, one's a tubist and one's a trombone. And Bob would study with Jacobs in the 40s. And uh, eventually you know, got into the civic orchestra and eventually um, after he got out of, out of the army, he was at West Point, um, he won a job in the Chicago Symphony under Fritz Reiner in the trombone section. Um, and so um, his, you know, I've got about 50 years of, of student examples represented in those 140 or so interviews and so it's interesting to to, to um, sort of track mr jacobs pedagogical evolution you know what 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 became more important as time went on and what became less important as time went on early in his early teaching i think he was from what i can glean he was more um uh, active with his medical terminology, use of medical terminology in his lessons. And some of the students that talk about that, you know, 
um, weren't sure if it was because he was trying to like impress them to like help them to understand that he knew what he's talking about so they would believe him um, or if that was just his way of talking at the time as we get later into his career into the 80s and 90s that becomes less and he's he uses simpler language and he even starts to get away from some of the gadgets that he is more well known for the breathing devices because he started to notice i think uh, he started to notice that the gadgets started to become the focus Hmm. not the music and so people would start to do the gadgets and just sort of check a box okay i'm good i did the gadgets and they wouldn't necessarily really um, continue on with what the gadgets could help them achieve in their artistry and so the gadgets became kind of a focus rather than the music so he started to um use the gadgets a bit less from what i can gather uh, from talking with others and certainly my own lessons. Um, and then also when I encountered him in 1981, it was wind and song and somewhere in the eighties on in the early nineties, it became song and wind. And so I think that was also a conscious thing on his part to, he noticed that people were really more focused on the, on the physical aspects um, rather than the, the artistic aspect aspects. And, and he is, he was totally about the music. He was 100% about the music. But to the extent that you would show up to his studio in knots, you know, physical and or emotional knots, he would work on those things. And oftentimes they had to do with, you know, breathing, you know, just being, getting yourself into a position where you were experiencing less, less effort and that sort of thing. So, you know, he would get this reputation, I think, as being the breathing guy, um, and the physical guy, but he was not, he was the music guy. He was the music, he was the total music man. Um, and, and just, just to help you get there, that's when he would, you know, work on the physical aspects of things. So, um, the tube of people TV is something that, that I do. Um, um, I've really been blessed with uh, an association with, um, a, uh, horn player in the Buenos Aires Philharmonic. Christian Mirabitu. Uh, he um, uh, happened to bond Tuba People TV a couple of years ago and was watching some episodes and um, thought, wow, this is amazing. And so he messaged me and, and said, these are really great. Thank you so much for doing them. And he said, would you mind if I added Spanish subtitles mm -hmm. to, these, to these interviews? And I said, of course, that would be great. It was like, yes, that would be amazing. So he's, he's actually um, at its 100... He's added Spanish subtitles to 100 episodes thus far. Hmm. And so um, they are now linked to, to the Tuba People TV uh, YouTube page as a playlist. So Arnold Jacobs in Espanol. And then also um, I'm working um, with David Martinez and I are, are uh, uh, developing the uh, www.arnoldjacobsinespanol.com website that will link, link uh, people to those to those interviews as well. Um, and so those things are, are really um, exciting to me just to keep this, uh, this legacy of Mr. Jacobs going because you know, it's once you pass away, it's, it's, you're not available for lessons or comments or anything. It's, you really do become history. And so he is part of history, but through this, um, these efforts, you know, whether it's, it's books, you know, there's many books, many articles that you can research, you can find out more about Jacobs. Uh, but then also, you know, some people read books and some people don't, some people watch videos and some people don't. So having this, this um, video um, opportunity, this, this option to learn more about Jacobs through his students and then in the more, in more uh, during COVID, I uh, sliced and diced um, uh, two hours worth of, of um, him talking to an audience, taking questions and giving answers. Sliced them by topic uh, into little three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine minute segments called um, Arnold Jacobs in his own words. And that's also on the, the Tuba People TV YouTube channel uh, with, on the, under the playlist um, in his own words. So. Um, just getting just getting to hear from him personally or you know directly in those those uh, those those 20 20 episodes of in his own words and then 
the 140 or so interviews with his, his former students, um, I think really you can get a pretty good sense of, of what he was about and who he was and uh, uh, what his message was. So that's been good. And then just doing things like this, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a, a really sharp increase, probably related to COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, just earlier this week, um, gave a presentation for the Italian Brass Week, um, which is based in Florence, Italy, and then um, been doing some stuff down in South America. And next week, I'll have a, uh, I'm, I'm giving a, uh, Luis Lubriel and I are going to give a, give, a, give a talk on Jacobs to um, uh, a group that's um, the, the Zoom session is originating in Pittsburgh, but you know it's obviously it's a it's a uh, uh, not just Pittsburgh; it's all over the place. Whoever wants to tune in, so these things are these things are increasing, and um, I'm happy to do them because uh, um, his his message was so honest and so simple um, and so successful. But I'd like to keep that keep that going as much as I can. I, I really feel like it's a calling, like I have to do this because it's 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 really good information. So. Excellent. Well, I know that, you know, I've seen a, quite a few of your Arnold Jacobs in his own words, clips, and watched cool. a few of the two people TV. So people watching, definitely check those out. Really great information there. Yeah. And uh, a wealth of knowledge over 140 episodes. That's, that's quite prolific, so. It is. It was fun. It was great. Great to do. I learned a lot and met a lot of old friends, but made a lot of new friends. And the really cool thing is the people that I hadn't yet met instantly, almost all of them, when I would call them or email them, they were like, oh, I, I'd be happy to anything, anything to, to keep Mr. Jacobs ideas alive, hmm. almost uniformly. It's nice. And so I just wonder, you touched on the fact that, you know, through these interviews, you just learned so much about um, him as a person. So you talked about the way that his teaching kind of developed. Um, but is there anything about him as an individual that you may have learned um, that sort of changed the way that you perceived lessons that he'd already taught you, maybe understood like of a place where he's coming from a little bit differently? Uh, so if I'm understanding the question, did I run in, in my interviews, did I run into something that I would then reevaluate from a lesson I had with him personally? Is that what you mean? Or were, or were you talking sure. about that he was a hoarder? You, you want to know uh. more about his hoarding, <laughs> hoarding characteristics? Yeah, sure. Well, I, you know, what made him more four dimensional, you know, as a person, I suppose. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the ones is uh, Mark Schubert, um, who used to play uh, second trumpet in the Honolulu Symphony back in the old days when it was the Honolulu Symphony, and and um, teaches at Baylor now. Um, uh, you, it, he had lessons with Jacobs. He was an NEC guy, you know, mm -hmm. his himself, bachelor's and stuff, back in the day in the seventies, and Boston trained, and uh, and so, um, but he had some lessons, a few lessons, a couple lessons with Jacobs and. And the, one of the things, aside from his lessons that I wanted to get documented, was this this one. <laughs> so apparently, the well, Jacobs ran long in the in the lesson, and this, of course, is on Mark's interview. So, and um, uh, Jacobs looked at his watch and said, "Oh my gosh, it's it's like I've got to get I've got to get all the way across the loop to an appointment." And Mark um, had actually ridden his motorcycle to his lesson, mm -hmm. and he said, "Well." You know, I mean, we could get there pretty quickly on the motorcycle if you don't <laughs> mind sitting on the back. And so just that image of, of you know, Arnold Jacobs, you know, <laughs> sitting on the back of Mark Schubert's motorcycle and, uh, and you know, going in and out of, of, of rush hour traffic in the loop in, in downtown Chicago, uh, you know, that was... That was pretty. That was pretty interesting. Just to imagine that. Um, I don't know. I just uh, there was a time when Bob Dorr, who's a plays a um, second trumpet up in uh, Minneapolis, the Minnesota Orchestra, where he was down in Florida. Um, Bob was working down in Florida at the time, and uh, Jacob's um, son lived in Florida, so he Jacob's would have occasions to visit Florida, and uh, 
you know, uh, Bob had been in contact with Jacobs to, to get some lessons and stuff. And he said, well, I'll be in Florida. And so, um, long story short, they, they managed to, uh, meet up. Um, Jake went to, I think went to Bob's house maybe, or, or maybe the Bob went to Jake's son's house. I forget, but just that, you know, Jacobs would be that accommodating while he's on vacation, you know, he's on vacation. He didn't need to see anybody, but you know, Bob had wanted to ask for a lesson. And so he accommodated him. I thought that was, that's pretty cool. And uh, a, a little funny side twist to that story is Bob had just, when he got the call from Mr. Jacobs, he had just finished a three hour brass content rehearsal. Oh, wow. And Jacob said, if you come over right now, I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, nothing like putting your best foot forward, you know, after a three hour right. brass quintet. And of course, the first thing he has to play is like pictures at an exhibition. So, <laughs> but, but, but the really great thing about that story that Bob um, talks about in his interview is how Jacobs got him to play the promenade to pictures like he never played it before. It was never mm. better even though he had been fatigued. And so the reason for that was to put the mind in the right place, not to be thinking about how fatigued I am, but to be thinking about how good I can sound. That's the, that's the short story to that story. Hmm. Uh, but then he was a, you know, his wife was a hoarder, Gazella, Mrs. Jacobs, she was a hoarder. And um, lots of stories about stacks and stacks and stacks of newspapers and articles, and you'd have just the right amount of the right path to go from one room to the next and <laughs> you'd go down into the basement to the old house on on normal avenue in chicago and uh you'd pass by i don't know three or four sets of washers and dryers you know oh, wow. one of the set one of the set worked but one set worked the rest of them didn't um yeah it's kind of funny and and uh jacobs was a jacobs was a a, a, a he was into the latest gadgets. And so I, I think the very first digital watch I ever saw was on his wrist. Hmm. And uh, he would, you know, he would update them regularly, you know, get the latest, greatest digital watch and, and, and that sort of thing. So, and, you know, he was, he was very, very um, an avarice reader, avarice, avid reader, avid reader, um, always keeping up with the latest medical uh, journals, the, the the studies that were coming out. In fact, so in, in 1991 or 90, 1992, early 1992, my wife, um, who has since passed, she was diagnosed with hepatitis C and hepatitis C was, was, was a new, was new in 1992. They had just discovered, I think in 1989 or 88, mm -hmm. I called him Mr. Jacobs and was talking to him about this. And he, he told me all about hepatitis C. Why would he need to know about hepatitis C to teach the tuba? He wouldn't. But his his thirst for knowledge was just so great and so deep that he he drank everything up. And um, yeah, he told me all about it. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, so, but he was a very generous person, and there's lots of people who tell you that that he got them concert tickets for free and gave them free lessons and. And that sort of thing. He charged me for all my lessons. I'll tell you that. So, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, um, he, he he was very 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 generous, and uh, with 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 some of the students who really needed needed that generosity. You know, who were serious, they're interested, and they were not capable of affording them, uh, affording his time. So. And, and, you know, back in those days when he was still teaching in his house, it was a, it was a trek. If you didn't have a car, there were lots of, you got on the bus with your tuba and you had to transfer a few times. It was like mm. a two or three hour affair to get to his house. Cause he was way on the South side of Chicago, 118 South, mm. you know, very much South side of Chicago. And um, it was difficult to get to his house if you were, you know, some in the suburbs or north, north of the lake, north, north, north of the loop, or, uh, you know, in Evanston or something like that. So he made it and those those lessons back in those days in the 50s and 60s, they would often, there's people who talk about those lessons going for two, three, four hours. 
Hmm. And but if your lesson time um, happened to be um, when a, a Star Trek was coming on, you know, the one with Spock and Kirk and everything, then the lesson would stop. We'd all go upstairs <laughs> and watch Star Trek. And then when the Star Trek was over, we'd we'd go back and finish the lesson. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I remember when The Next Generation came out, um, like it was probably 88 or 89, I was having a lesson with them and, and we were talking about that. And and uh, it was early, early, like only the first few episodes had come out. And so like the data character hadn't really been developed yet. And so he was, you know, he had remarked that they were really interested in, he was really interested to see if the data character would, would uh, resemble the Spock character because he really liked Spock. Mm. Nice. That's all so interesting, and I had no idea. <laughs> but I guess uh, that's what's so great about Two People TV, and and uh, you know, getting the chance to talk to all those people. So yeah, yeah, it's a great project. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, you know, this discussion was great, and uh, you know, it's so great to hear about you know how simple really it should be. You know, uh, playing and breathing and all of that stuff. Because I know yeah. uh, for me especially, I was you know. I've been so caught up in the breath and all of that. So, right. Um, right. Yeah, so thank it's, you. It's easy. Yeah, you bet. And uh, we're really proud of you, Delano. Really proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank way you. To go. Not, uh, not at all surprised. Uh, Cause you sound terrific. You know, <laughs> oh, thank sound you. Terrific. And I hope you keep a, keep a focus on the, on the conducting a little bit too. Cause mm. you've got that, you've got that, uh, in your system as well, I think. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So that's really, uh, it's really terrific. Maybe one day. Who knows? And don't stop. Don't stop playing basketball. <laughs> so oh, what, no, you know, I'm what, trying. what you don't know about Delano is he's actually a really good basketball player. <laughs> and I wish oh, I could well. wish we could have played more often, but I was grateful for the times we had. I know. I know. Well, I'm sure I'll be, I'll try to be that way someday. So, uh, you know, I'll pull out the shoes and we can hit the hardwood. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you and have a good day. And again, thank you so much for being here. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.